Well, hey. 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 Um, I want to start off today with a little public service announcement. Um, we are about one month away from filing taxes. Do you guys know that? So we're, we're just about a month away from filing taxes. I don't think they're going to push it back this year. April 15th is coming. How many people love tax time? Oh, yeah. Tax time. Love it, right? Right? Anyone? <laughs> Paying taxes is like an awful feeling, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I've had taxes taken, but I've never had to pay taxes. Do you know what I'm talking about here? I mean, because those are two different things. When you have taxes taken, it's because you have a job, and they take money out of your paycheck, whether you like it or not, and they keep taking it over and over again. You don't get a choice, and they keep taking it. And then at the end of the year, the government sometimes says, hey, uh, uh, we might have taken a little too much. Our bad, right? And they say, and they say here's uh, $500 go and buy yourself some sneakers or something. And you're like, thanks, government. Like, this is awesome. We're going to go to Chili's tonight, you know? Um, so, I, but now there's a difference when you pay taxes. There are some people who pay taxes, right? They hold on to their money all year long, right? It's their money and they hold on to it all year long. And then at the end of the year, the government says, you owe us 40%. And I'm like, that's a lot of, does that seem like a lot of money? I don't, I don't know about your house, but we don't, we don't call 911. We put out all our own fires at our house. Like, I don't know why I'm giving that kind of money to the government, but, but they tell us we have to pay taxes, right? Got to pay taxes. I heard on the news that we are in a recession and we owe China $11 trillion. So, I, I, and I'm like, what? I don't know 11, I don't owe China nothing. You, you owe China $11 trillion. I, 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 you know, we owe T-Mobile like 90 bucks, but, but you must have been roaming while you were, I, I don't know, I don't know what the deal is. Now, so I wanted to give an illustration of taxes and for the parents in the room, the best time, this is a good time of year, but the best time of year to teach your kids about taxes is at Halloween, right? Yes. Because your yeah, kids are going to put tax. in, like, legit three hours of work amassing what should be take-home candy. You mm -hmm. know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. here? Like, it should be take-home candy. But when they come home at, on Halloween night, you say to them, man, that is a nice big bag of candy, Harry Potter. Uh, <laughs> you know? And, and you say, but let me explain to you how taxes work. And this is how it works, right? First, you say... Okay, well, you know, before we get started here, we've got to take out some income tax. Uh -huh. So we take out some income tax, all right, there, because Uncle Sam's got to get his. And, and, uh, and, well, actually, to ensure that you have candy in your old age, we need to take out some Social Security tax, right? And your kid's watching this, and their eyes are getting big. Quit your whining. You'll get this in like 50 or 60 years or something like that. And you say, listen, we're going to put this uh, up here and no one will touch it, right? No one will touch it for like 50 or 60 years. <laughs> well, I don't know why I'm lying to you. Actually, grandpa's going to eat all that candy, right? I mean, th that's the way it's going to go. So I, hopefully you have grandkids or something like that. And then you think to yourself, well, okay, this is mine. Whoa, 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 whoa you got to get state tax, right? There's, there's state tax we got to take out there. And, and uh, well, we live in California. I don't know what to tell you about that, except, you know, we're going to, we're just going <laughs> to, uh, that's how it goes. And then at the very end, you just say, well, here you go, Sparky. Here's your <laughs> Snickers bar. Wait a second, actually, before you do that. Um, you got a, yeah, you got a eight and a half, eight and a half percent, uh, that's sales tax, there you go. No, no, you can have your own candy, there you go, everybody take some candy, there you go, take that, where's the crew, get the crew some candy, woo! <laughs> so that's uh, crazy, but that is sort of the way taxes work, right? Um, tax time is when we settle up with Uncle Sam. That's what we do. We set up with our Uncle Sammy. Um, we both look at our pay stubs, right? And we, we look at the dollars in the bank that we made this year and the numbers on Uncle Sam's spreadsheet somewhere in the cloud or something. And we have to make it right. And we have to pay taxes. 
And some of us get money back, and some of us have to pay. I mean, that's the way it is. But we have to, we are, when we're done, we're made right with the government. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. or, or else, you know, they throw us in jail, I guess, or something like that. Listen, as we continue with our series on Romans today, we're going to be looking at being made right with God. And uh, we had so much bad news, right, Glenn? Yeah, we in, did. in chapter, the end of chapter one, all of chapter two, into chapter three, I mean, it was just bad news. And, and Paul kept telling us, you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner, and you're a sinner. And I can't call Janie a sinner, but she is. you're a sinner, Janie. Um, so we're all sinners, right? It's a little bit like the old Oprah shows. Everybody, hey, look underneath your chair. <laughs> No, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're all sinners, you know? Um, that's what it looks like. And, and we saw last week at the end of chapter 3, and this is where we're going to jump in uh, today. I'm going to kind of backtrack into chapter 3, and then we'll get into 4. Here's the first point on your sermon notes outlined there is, we all have red in our ledger. To borrow this banking accounting term, we all have red in our ledger. And in Romans 3.21... It says, but now, and Glenn told us last week it was the biggest but in the Bible. <laughs> no, I didn't Big, say that. Oh, no, he didn't say that. He said a junior high boy would say that. What he was thinking is if Steve was here, Steve would have said it. <laughs> the biggest but in the book of Romans so far comes up, and it says, but now, God has shown us a way to be what? Made right. Made right. With him, without, without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. It says, we are made right with God by placing our faith where? In Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. And then verse 23 is this red ledger part. For everyone has sinned. We've all sinned. And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. No matter who you are, that's how you're made right. But we all have to do that because every one of us has sinned, right? We all have read in our ledger. Before there was QuickBooks, and, uh, and accountants kept track of things in actual books is what they did. They, they used these books, and, and uh, those ledgers had every transaction written down. And you were either in the black or you were in the red, right? If you're in the black, that means you had money. If you're in the red, that means you're, you're in debt. Uh, if you've ever heard, I'm sure all of you have heard of Black Friday, the reason that term is there is because basically throughout the year, retail stores are operating in the red all year long. They still haven't made any money until they get to November. Then they open the doors, people trample each other, and suddenly they're in the black, right? They, they've made money at that point. So we're all sinners. We all have red in our ledger. And nobody is in the black when it comes to God. All have sinned. But we see that big but says we can be made right with God with the, red, with the red in our ledger. How? And, and the answer is through faith. And Paul is going to use this illustration, this example of Abraham. And so we're going to do a case study here. I'm calling this an audit of Abraham. So this is the IRS audit of Abraham. And so let's jump into it today. First of all, quick review. For those of you who are new to faith, or maybe you're just checking out this Jesus thing for the first time, Abraham is the father of our faith. Um, but Abraham started out as Abram from Ur. I mean, he was just a, a regular guy, a, a, a regular backwoods guy from a culture that worshipped idols. And, and, and get this, his name, Abram, the name Abram actually means great father or like awesome dad or exalted father. But, but get this, Abram is 75 years old now and he has no kids. Awkward, right? Um, <laughs> How many, how many of you guys sweated naming your kids, right? When you name your kids, you're, you're branding them for life a little bit, right? You, you have to be sure. You have to think about all kinds of things. Like people with names. Some people have ruined other names. You know what I'm talking about? Like anybody consider Adolf? Not, not so much. Or Jezebel? Like we didn't use that. Um, you have to worry about rhyming. Is there any, you know, rhyming problems or anything like that? I mean, even with the name Abraham, this guy that we're talking about, when you think of the name Abraham, I don't know about you, but I only think of one thing. I think of Honest Abe, I think of Abraham Lincoln, freed the slaves and was assassinated. I, you know, I don't know a whole lot of Abrahams that are flying out of the delivery rooms these days, right? I never wanted to name my daughter Hannah. I, we had three kids, and each time I, Nicole was lobbying for Hannah, and I said, no, 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 we can't have Hannah. And the reason why is because I didn't want a Hannah 
Banana. banana. You don't want a Hannah banana, right? Hannah, Hannah, Bobana, banana, fana, fofana, me, my, you know, you know the song, Hannah banana. Don't call her Hannah banana, okay? It bothers me. So um, I, I hate that. But every time somebody would meet this guy, Abram, they would know, wow, great father. Like, that's, that's impressive. How many kids do you have? Can you imagine? Awkward. Uh, um, yeah, none yet. You're like 75, aren't you? And he's like, you know, at, at this point, it's not happening, right? It's just not happening. Um, and, and then God shows up. And we see in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham's story starts in Genesis chapter 12 and goes for like 13 chapters. You can read it on your own if you'd like to. But in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. The Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. Can you imagine how he heard that? I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. And we see God meets this guy, Abram, who's nobody from nowhere, really. And, and I, I don't know. Uh, he says, I know you don't have any kids yet, but I'm going to make you into a great nation. And so Abram packs the mules and goes. Um, he leaves everything behind. A couple of weeks ago, I, I preached a sermon called Go Means Go, and, and he just went. He, he followed God's lead, and he went. But then, once he gets there, you know, nothing happens. For like over a decade, nothing, not a zilch. Like, God comes back and eventually meets Abraham again, and he says, listen, I'm going to change your name. And can you imagine Abraham thinking to himself, finally, somebody, like, change my name, God. Like, I'm 86, and I haven't had any kids, and they're still calling me great father, right? And he says, you can name me whatever you want, just anything else, gray beard, you know, whatever you, whatever you want to call me. But, but don't, not Abram. And God says, I'm not, well, you're no longer going to be known as Abram. Now you will be Abraham, or father of many nations. Can you imagine, like, Abram at that point? He's like, what? Like, why? Like, what are you doing, God? And so we jump into Romans today, and we're going to see how Paul uses Abram as this illustration of how we can be made right with God. And, uh, and so we're going to see this and jump into Abraham's story. It says, here's the first point. How was Abraham made right? We're going to see how he was made right. In Romans chapter 4, we're finally to Romans chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being what? Made right with God. What did he discover about that? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that's not, that was not God's way. For the scripture tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, the key to this whole chapter, the key to this whole passage here is that term, God counted him as righteous. That's an accounting term. Last week, Glenn told us about a, a religious term, a legal term, a slavery term. And in verse chapter four here, we see this accounting term. He was counted, it counted him. And it's this direct reference to Genesis 15, a little bit later on in, in uh, Abraham's story. Genesis 15, 5 and 6 says this. Then the Lord took Abram outside and said to him, look up in the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. I, I, I'm, I'm imagining eye roll at that moment. You know what I mean? Just like, well, well come on, God. And Abraham, it says, believed the Lord. And the Lord counted him, there's that phrase, the exact phrase from Romans 4, counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now remember, this is over a decade later, right, after the original promise. And every week, Abe is like, Sarah, are you ovulating? And, and Sarah's <laughs> like, I'm never ovulating, Abe. And he's like, well, we should try, don't you think? I mean, God told us we should, we should keep at it, right? Um, <laughs> And God reaffirms this promise to Abram. And he says, look up in the stars, you know. That's how many kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, great, 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 right? 
and your family and their children and their children and their children and their children and their children, chil- chil- right? Like, like that's what he's saying. And I can only imagine Abram looking up in the stars and listening to God and thinking, really, God? Like, really? But I want you to get this because this is the important part of Romans 4. Abraham had a credit added to, on his ledger. He had this credit added to his ledger. That word counted, or in some translations you'll see it, it says credited, is the most important word in this passage. God's righteousness, God's actual righteousness is credited to Abraham for simply believing. God's righteousness was put on Abraham's ledger. It's a little bit like having college kids. You'll understand this, right? You you, you got college kids, and college kids are always broke. This is just a a truth of life. I'm always getting notifications because they have the same bank as me whenever their account drops below $25. And it freaks me out because I think it's my account, but it's not. It's theirs always, every single time. So let's say your kid in college texts you this, right? He says, no mun, no fun, your son. And then you text back, obviously, too bad, so sad, dad, right? I mean, that's, that's what you But let's say my daughter called me and she said, dad, I've only got, I got 16 bucks in the bank. That's all I got in the bank. And dad, I got to buy books and uh, I, I, I need some school supplies. And dad, if I don't have some Chipotle now, I'm going to die. And I think to myself, I don't know why it's Chipotle, but it always is. I think to myself, it, maybe she will die. I don't know. It's possible if she doesn't get her Chipotle right now. And I decide I'm going to transfer all the money I have, all the money I have in my bank account, and I'm going to transfer it to her. So I open Venmo or, or I use the Zelle <laughs> app on my phone, and I immediately transfer everything I have to their account. And now she has like $95 or something <laughs> like that because I feel like you're judging me. That's all I got. I don't know what to tell you. But... Um, uh, it's been credited to her account. I can't get it back because I credit it to her account, and it's hers now. Get this. Abraham already had this credit on his ledger, and he got it just because he believed the Lord. It's a credit that can't be taken away. It, continuing in Romans 4, it says this. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous not because of their work, But because of what? Faith in God who forgives who? Sinners, right? Sinners. If you want, you can circle that and write me. Yeah, (laughs) right? Um, Here's the truth in it. We see this is that wages is what you are owed for working. Wages is what you're owed for working. Wages is the premise of every job you've ever had, right? Um, I worked this many hours. You owe me this much pay. You, you never really say to your boss, I don't know anybody that says to their boss when they get paid, thank you so much for this paycheck, right? Anybody call your boss on payday and say, thank you so much, or drop them a little thank you, and you're like, thank you for paying me, right? No, right? You think, you think you better pay up, fella, and, and what's FICA and SDI, and why do people keep taking all my money? Like, you know, um, some people think if I do good deeds, if I do enough good things, then God owes me this righteousness. God owes me salvation. And my response is, really? Like, how many good things? What kinds of good things? What about all the bad things you've done? What about the red in your ledger? Um, God doesn't owe you, but he has credited us with righteousness because we believe, just because we believe and because he's a good God. Paul, as he continues in Romans 4, is also going to use the illustration of King David, right? If Abraham is the father of our faith. King David and Moses are probably the other two most famous guys in our faith. And he uses this illustration of King David. It says in Romans 4, uh, verse 6, David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without what? Without working for it. Oh, what a joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, for what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. And we see in this part, you know, David's debt was canceled in this part. His debt is canceled. And let's remember, this is David's sin was not like lightweight sin. Like David's sin was, 
Paul's quoting uh, Psalm 31 or 32, 1 and 2, and this is right after the Bathsheba incident. And the Bathsheba incident is as bad as sin incident as I can think of in the Bible, right? He commits adultery with this woman. He tries to cover it up. He, he murders what would have been one of his like inner circle, Uriah, this guy, and he murders him, and then he covers it up again. This was no small debt, but God paid his sin debt. And we see that, uh, that illustration of how God does that. So let's look at when was Abraham made right uh, as we continue. Uh, taxes are due on when? April 15th. April 15th. You can file an extension, but guess what? Eventually, you're going to run out of extensions. There is a due date, and at some point, you have to pay your taxes. At some point, you've got to get right with Uncle Sam. And this may not seem important, but it really is. So let's jump into Romans chapter 4. Starting in verse 9, it says this. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised? Or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. Circumcision, it says, was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. That's a lot of circumcision. I don't know about the rest of you, but that makes me uncomfortable a little bit. Um, whenever you see the word circumcision as you're reading through this, he's really just talking about adherence to the law, this law that the Jews had, right, and, and the Jewish law. But Abraham, the point is this, Abraham was credited before God gave the law. It's before God gave the law. Abraham didn't have the Ten Commandments. He just didn't have them. He didn't, Abraham didn't have a Bible. Abraham, uh, all Abraham had was this one promise from God, right? I mean, uh, Abraham was completely alone as a believer, living in a, in a world filled with unbelievers, and he was surrounded by these people. And, and I mean, today we have, we have the complete Bible. We have um, a church service to attend and be taught. We have Bible studies and books and right now media, and we have a, a community group where we can work out our faith a little bit. And, and this... But this all happened way, way before Moses gave them the law, right? I heard a story one time of a Sunday school teacher who was uh, asking his class, how were people saved in the Old Testament times? How were they saved in the Old Testament? And after a pause, one, one guy replied, well, by keeping the law. And the teacher said, well, that's right. Except the guy in the back of the room interrupted, he said, uh, Hey, my Bible says that by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. It's in Romans chapter 3. And so the teacher says, well, uh, anybody else, you know, got, a, got an answer here, have an idea? And another student replied, he said, well, they were saved by bringing sacrifices to God. And, and the teacher said, well, yes, that's right, sort of looking around. And he tried to go on with the lesson, but the guy in the back of the room wasn't having it. And he says, hey, my Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. And that's in Hebrews 10. But this time the teacher was, you know, kind of, what do I do? I don't know what to do here anymore. And, he, and so he looks at the guy in the back. He says, well, why don't you tell us how people were saved in the Old Testament? And the man said, in the Old Testament, just like in the New, we're saved by faith. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks 21 times, we're told that these people were saved by faith, saved by faith, and they were all Old Testament people. They were saved by faith. That's how it was done. In Galatians 5, it says this, For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, there is no benefit in being circumcised or being uncircumcised. What is important is our faith expressing itself in love. Law, before the law, after the law, it's the same deal. Old Testament, New Testament, <clears throat> we are all saved by faith. Not by keeping the law, <clears throat> not by any works. Listen as Paul continues. <clears throat> it says, clearly, 
God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God. That comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless, it says. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. In fact, it says the only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break at all, right? So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a what? Free gift. As a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe, that is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. This promise, this salvation, um, it's a gift, right? We see it's a free gift. And, it, and a gift can't be earned. It can only be received. A gift can't be earned. It can only be received. In one of his last interviews uh, before he died, um, somebody asked Billy Graham, why do you think God will let you into heaven? And this was Billy Graham's response. He said, I won't be in heaven because I preach to large crowds or because I've tried to live a good life. I'll be in heaven for one reason. Many years ago, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to make our forgiveness possible and rose again from the dead to give us eternal life. Listen, if Billy Graham can't earn it, you know I can't, you can't earn it. Like, we just, we can't earn it. There's no way we could do that. Um, it's a gift, and it's received in faith, right? because of the God who brings dead things back to life, right? And we see that in the cross. So, what is required for Abraham to be made right? And we're getting near the end of this passage here. What is required for Abraham to be made right? It says, even when there was no reason for hope, or, or in some translations it says, hope against hope. There's no reason for hope. Abraham kept hoping. He kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. By the way, don't say that to your wife ever, you know. <laughs> um, he, there's no reason for hope here, right? It, it says there's no reason at all, like none. He and Sarah are 100 years old at this point. They got no kids. This promise has been in place for 24 years, still no kids. You're 100 years old. At some point, you just give up hope, right? You just say, it's not going to, no amount of little blue pills is going to do anything, if you know what I'm talking about here. So it, it, they just gave up hope. It's, it says his body was as good as dead. It was like, if, if, if Abraham was on Jeopardy, right, it would be like this. Alex, I'll try geriatrics for 600. Yes, and the answer is, what's more likely to happen tomorrow morning? You wake up and find out Sarah's pregnant or you've had a stroke. I'd say, what is a stroke, Alex, right? I'll take geriatrics for 800. Uh, there's just no chance this is going to happen, right? But the Bible says, this story says, he held on to hope against hope. And he simply, this is as simple as I can give it, he believed the promise. He believed the promise. And that's it. I, I want it to be more complicated than that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, unlike Abraham, most of us prefer a faith where we depend on God a little bit, but we also depend on ourselves, right? Like, we depend on God, but, but also on us, right? I mean, if God made a promise to any of us today and said, hey, hey, you're going to have a baby at 99 years old, we might say, okay, God, like, thanks, you the man, right, you know? Um, but, but then we would immediately go to the internet, right? And we would start searching for fertility clinics or, or uh, home remedies. Um, we would Google how to have kids in your 90s, which I'll save you some time. If you Google that, there are zero results, okay? It, it's not a thing. Um, but we want to hedge our bets. We tend to want to hedge our bets. We're hoping God's going to keep his promise, but we got other ways to get it done if we have to. Like, God, I'll, I'll, I'll do my part and keep trying and trying and trying. Um, it's what Pastor Tony Evans calls, I, this is an interesting concept, he calls it mutual fund faith. 
If you know anything about the stock market, right, you know a mutual fund is a way of spreading out your investments, right? It, it, it's a really big fund where a bunch of people have pooled their money and you invest in a lot of different companies all at one time and your risk is spread out a little bit. So if one company fails, you don't, you don't lose everything, right? It's like all your eggs are not in one basket. And there's some wisdom to that in the financial world, but it's toxic in God's world. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's toxic when it comes to God and yet that's precisely what so many of us do. We hedge our bets. We hedge our faith in the simple things that God sends. You know, it sounds too simple. It really does. But all Abraham did was believe that promise. In uh, verse 20, it says, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. What? What? It, I, I'm going to read the rest of this and we'll come back to it. But in, in fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Boy, that sounds like a nice little summation. But it says he never wavered. Maybe some of you don't know the whole story of Abraham, right? Like, like that Abraham lied and told, you know, these foreigners that his wife was his sister because she was too good looking, right? And he said, well, yeah, take my sister, you know? And he did that. He did that twice. I mean, he did that twice. He, uh, he, his wife comes to him and says, hey, you know, I'm never going to have babies. Go have babies with my maidservant, Hagar, over there. And Abraham goes, D okay. By the way, stupid. I don't. And he goes along with it. And then, of course, Sarah gets mad at him. And she says, I can't believe you. And you're like, but you said. And, and that's a lose-lose situation at that point. <laughs> I, I, it's not like he never wavered, if you know the story, right? Um, Abraham had faith. But he certainly didn't have this perfect faith. Um, I, I think when Abraham was out shopping for strollers and baby monitors and the lady at the front looked at him at 99, he was like, it's for the grandkids or the great grandkids. Like, you know, he, uh, he, you don't need, here's the point. You don't need a flawless faith. Faith is not this flawless life that you live once you've believed in God. But it's getting back up and putting your faith back in God, getting back up and following Jesus. Get back up and follow Jesus. It's not this perfect faith, but it's this very real faith where you keep looking back to God that he'll do what he said he would do. Which leads me to... So oh, I'm so happy you guys are here. Um, so much better than preaching alone in that room with uh, Dallas just staring at us. Uh, here, here's what so was... To, it, in Romans chapter 4, verse 23, the end part of this passage sums up the so what, like I don't, I don't even need to write anything except let point you back to Scripture. It says, and when God counted him, Abraham, as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's sake or for his benefit. It was recorded for whose? Our benefit, too. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Listen, death and taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Death and taxes. We all have to settle up with the man at some point, and we need to be made right. And Paul says this wasn't just for Abraham. But exactly like Abraham, he offers us the same exact deal. He will credit your account if you just believe in him. The one who raised Jesus Christ, our Lord, from the dead, it says in that passage. Written on your account will be the word righteous. It'll be written in black. No amount of red will ever matter ever again. And when you die, Jesus will open this ledger that has your name and your life on it. And when he looks at it, he will say, oh, okay, I see. You've been credited as righteous. Listen, would you just pray with me? I, I don't know where you're at if you're watching this, but maybe you haven't accepted this credit that God is offering. The only requirement is that you would accept this free gift, that you would 
uh, 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 believe in this Jesus Christ that we call our Lord and Savior. Believe in this God who gave us Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That you would invite him into your heart. That you would ask him to be Lord of your life. If you have never done that, wherever you are right now, whatever time of day, behind whatever screen you're on, all you have to do is say this simple prayer. God, I believe you are God. God, I, I believe you sent your son Jesus Christ to die for me. God, I accept this credit, this free gift that you're offering me of eternal life, that I cannot work for it, that I cannot earn it. God, I pray today that you would come into my life and begin to let me grow in my knowledge of you. I want to follow you because of what you're offering me through faith. In your son Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.